take it away, Sydney. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Hello, my name is Sydney. Um, I used to work at Independence Regional, um, but recently left to pursue my career in social work, but I still wanted to keep up with the sewing programs. Um, this is the first sewing machine program that we've done. Um, I just have a personal machine, so we could do this in person because unless everybody someday wants to bring in all their machines themselves, um, I just have the one. So that's why we decided to go with a virtual format. Plus I can really kind of um, take the webcam and show you up close what I'm doing in the different parts of the machine. Um, so we're gonna start off with going over a sewing machine, answering any questions. If we have time and there's interest, I can do the um, hand sewing basic skills, or if you have a machine, we can even practice some of the stitches I talk about here. Um, this program is really for you all and please ask any questions, any feedback is welcome. Um, I'm excited to be here with y'all. So I'm gonna go ahead and share. I do have a little PowerPoint with some information about sewing machines. I'll kind of be going back and forth um, as I go through the program. And there'll be times where you can see my face and I'm talking to you and times where I'm kind of moving around the camera. So just, um, you can type something in the chat box and Christy will let me know, or you can come off mute and um, I'll answer any questions. So again, thank you for being here today. So the first thing I want to talk about are the different parts of a sewing machine. So this photo is clearly labeled. Um, and after we kind of talk about it, I will show you on my camera, on my personal machine. Um, and there's lots of different brands of sewing machines. So everybody's might look a little bit different, but the parts, the basic parts are going to be the same. They might just be in a slightly different place or look a little different. Um, so we have, and Christy, can you see my mouse cursor? Okay. Then, so up yes. here, uh, okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> so we have, we'll start, we'll kind of go in a circle um, counterclockwise. We have our bobbin winder and I'll show you um, what a bobbin looks like. It is the tiny little spool that holds your thread. Some of them are clear, some of them are colored. Um, if you have an older sewing machine, they might be wooden. Um, and it's just a tiny little, little thing that you wind some of your thread from your main spool onto because with the sewing machine, unlike hand sewing, you have two different thread sources that you're pulling from. Um, so one will go on to the spool holder up at the top and the other one, once you wind it onto the bobbin, which I'll show you um, how to do, it will go down into the bobbin holder, which is um, below the needle. So we have our bobbin winder, then we have our spool holder and you can kind of see over here, we have the thread take up lever so that's where you will thread your machine. I'll show you um, how to do that on mine. And then you would thread it through your needle. And this is where the sewing happens. Um, your presser foot is the piece that holds down the fabric as you sew. There's lots of different kinds for different purposes. I'll show you the ones I have. Um, there is an endless number that you can purchase and it really varies based on sewing machine brand. Um, so up top, you have your thread tension dial, which um, really determines, so thread tension can look different for every type of fabric you're using and every type of thread. And we'll go more into depth about why that is so important when you're using a sewing machine. Um, stitch width and stitch length, those, um, I don't know if it'll, I'll try to show you guys on my sewing machine. You can actually see the needle move left and right when you change the width um, and length as well. And then of course you have your stitches to choose from. So mine looks very similar. I use a Singer sewing machine. I'll show you all now and go ahead and stop sharing for a minute. I'll show you all my sewing machine. Um, it is a Singer tradition. It is one of the least expensive ones you can actually get, um, but I have had it for about um, seven or eight years now. Um, so one of the things I talked about was winding a bobbin. You'll have to forgive me. I'm still playing with the uh, 
with the camera. It's a little new to me. Um, so winding a bobbin, we will start with that because that's really the first thing that you're going to need to do if you're going to be sewing on a machine. Um, and as I said, some people's machines will look a little bit different. Um, so up top we have our spool holder. So that's where you will slide a spool of thread onto and there's a little, usually a little plastic piece to secure it. And then right here, you can see there's actually directions on my machine with what to do. Um, so there's a little um, metal piece that you want to hook your thread through. And depending on whether you are threading your machine for use or going to wind a bobbin, that determines where you'll pull it next. So once you have it hooked through there, and I don't normally do this one handed, but it can be done. Um, once you have it on there, you will pull it either around this way if you're threading your machine, or you will actually loop it around this piece here. I'm gonna have to set this down for just a moment. Okay, so you can see that I have looped it around this piece um, counterclockwise. So it comes across here and then loops around. So that's just to hold the thread while we, um, while we wind our bobbin. So as I mentioned, bobbins are these little plastic pieces. Um, most of them will have very hard to see this tiny little hole on one side. Um, so it'll look something like that. You can kind of see there's a little hole there. So it's really important that you find that hole because that's where you're going to um, wind your thread through so that it doesn't just spin off the bobbin when you're winding it, but it actually holds tight. Let me grab an empty bobbin for you all. They also tend to break sometimes, um, but they're cheap and you can get lots of them. I have probably 20 different bobbins. Um, this one is broken. It happens, not the end of the world. I will say one of the worst things is when you are in the middle of a sewing project and you run out of thread on your bobbin. It will happen, especially if you are using the same thread for a really large project. Um, not a big deal because you just rewind it, but it's always a little bit disappointing. Um, so I'm going to put the camera back on to the computer so that I have both hands readily available and then just kind of slide it over so that you all can see the top of my machine because that's really what we're working with here. Oh, and Gina mentioned in the chat, she says, I always seem to break my threads and I'm not sure if the length or the tension is set to the right setting. That will it's probably going to be the tension, um, especially if it's breaking. The only other thing I would say is maybe you're using, if you're using older thread, there's a possibility it can break. Um, that might also have something to do with machine cleaning, which will go over ma basic maintenance as well. Um, but I suspect that is a tension related issue. Um, so with the bobbin, as I said, there are these tiny little holes it's kind of um, difficult to thread uh, through. Gosh, I'm gonna choose another bobbin because that one's, some of them are also not fully punched through. Um, so if you can ever find metal bobbins, I actually prefer them. They're just a little bit harder to find, but they are usually a little bit higher quality. And this is like the equivalent to sewing of sewing machine sewing to threading a tiny needle with hand sewing. Um, so it definitely requires probably the most patience. Also, uh, bobbins for different machines are different. Like I have one here, it's green. Um, this was from the sewing machine I learned to sew on in high school. Um, it's a Husqvarna. 
do not use one of those because they're um, they're very nice and very expensive. Um, and at the end of this presentation, I'll kind of go over some of the different brands and things to consider if you're looking to purchase the machine for yourself. Um, there are just so many options out there and it really comes down to your personal needs and preferences for a machine. Okay. So now that I have this bobbin unwound, there we go. Okay. So you can see I have the thread pulled up through. So now there's something to hold a little bit of, um, give it a little bit of tension. That's actually the most important part when winding a bobbin, at least on my particular machine. Because if you don't have enough tension, here, I'll show you all what happens. So you can see we have the bobbin on the little bobbin winder. Um, you have to, on my machine at least, push it over because I will be using my foot presser to wind it. Um, and if it's not pushed over, the foot presser will just move the needle. So if I don't pull on this, what happens is it just kind of gets tangled. But if you take care and you kind of take the time to wind it a few times first, um, it might seem a little tedious, but it actually really helps to make sure that the thread stays where it's supposed to and that you get a nice tight wind on your bobbin so you can get as much thread as possible. So once I have it pushed over, I'll kind of pull up on the, the loose end of the thread to create some tension. And then there we go. So now, and I'm not going to line the whole thing because I actually already have a bobbin with this color in my machine. Um, but now we have a bobbin with some thread on it. So now we are ready to actually start using our machine. Um, make sure you clip that, like that tail that we talked about, because otherwise it'll just get tangled when you're trying to sew. I'm to put this in. Okay. So that's really the first thing that you're going to do if you're sewing on a sewing machine. Some of the other things to kind of consider. Um, so we have this and you want to make sure it's pushed over um, so that your so that your needle moves and not your bobbin winder. Um, as I mentioned before, when you wind a bobbin, you use this little, nice little piece right here. Every machine might be a little bit different, um, but when you actually want to sew, you will take it and you will bring it down. And again, mine has these really nice um, visuals. So you can see step one, step two, three, four, and five. Um, it's really simple. You just take it down and up, but right here, and it's a little bit difficult to see unless you have your machine needle in the right position. Um, so right here, you can see there's a little piece um, of silver metal. So that is our thread catcher because we've just pulled our thread up and down um, in the machine, I'm trying to get the angle, there we go. So now it's up and it's really important that you make sure it catches. So this is actually a little bit of a loop there and it'll hold the thread in place. And this is what impacts, um, one of the things that impacts your upper thread tension. So now that we've um, threaded it there, you will need to not only thread it through your needle, but there's also going to be a little um, metal piece there to loop your thread around. Again, making sure that um, tension is managed 
and is nice and taut. Um, and this might, again, be something I need to do with two hands. So I'm just going to set down for a minute. So you'll loop it around there. And then you can thread the needle. Um, one nice thing about sewing machine needles is they're usually a little bit, um, have a larger eye than some hand sewing needles. And then because the thread is usually nice and stiff, um, it's pretty easy, in my opinion, to thread. So now we have threaded our upper, um, from our upper source. Um, and now we'll talk about our bobbin, which we just wound one. Um, and this will be the part, uh, it goes in here. So some machines, instead of it coming this way, it'll be like a little um, pocket right there and you'll go down into it. But the bobbin will always look pretty much the same. I see in here, this is the inside of the sewing machine. Um, our bobbin holder will go right there. And as I mentioned, some, it'll be a little bit different. It might be, it's kind of like a front loading versus a top loading washer. Um, but it serves the exact same purpose and loading it is pretty much the same process. So here we have our bobbin and our bobbin holder. So if you look right there, it's a little bit difficult to see but there is a little tiny notch. Um, and that is what's going to catch your bobbin thread. And then it pulls it through to here where the thread actually comes out. So when you put in your bobbin, you wanna make sure that um, it's facing, like the way the thread is coming off the bobbin is going the same direction as that little notch. Um, so when you pull it, instead of just continuing to pull through, it actually catches and then you pull it snug through there. So you can kind of see, and I know it's a little bit difficult because it's so small, um, but you can see the thread is now from my bobbin is coming through this little dime sized slot. And there's this little piece here. So this is really important to consider when you are putting your bobbin holder in place in your machine. So I have to make sure that it lines up with, gosh, and it really is because we are inside the machine now, um, with this slot right there. So that's where the little lip will go. And once you slide it in, you just lock it in place. And that's how you put your bobbin into the lower carriage. Um, so the next step is we're going to pull this thread up so that it's at the same place as our top thread. Um, and the way you do that is just pulling your needle down and up and then pulling that uh, top needle thread and it will catch the bobbin thread and pull both of them up. Um, so bobbin thread can be a little bit tricky. It has a tendency to get tangled, especially if you're doing any back stitching or um, working with maybe thicker fabric that your needle's struggling to get through. So chances are you will need to pull your bobbin out more times um, not just when it's gone empty, but a lot of times when it gets tangled. Um, so now we have our working threads, top and bottom. We have our bobbin in place and you can just go ahead and close that cover. My machine has like a little storage piece um, that slides in, but I'll leave that off for now. So now in theory, we are ready to sew. The next step to really consider is 
all of these, there we go, all of these dials and levers that I mentioned on that overview. So we have our thread tension right here. We have stitch width, stitch length, and then stitch selection. So the basic stitch that you'll be using is going to be just this one here where it, it's just a single wide, relatively short in length. Um, and that's what you'll use for most seams. So there's a couple different stitches you can see on this here. Um, we have a buttonhole stitch, some zigzag ones. A lot of these are decorative, um, especially if you purchase a machine that has a lot of embroidery stitches or is used for quilting. You'll get an even larger variety. Since I mostly use mine for garment sewing, I didn't really need anything fancy. Um, and for mine, because it's not computerized, I just have to turn the dials to select my stitch. And you can kind of see that there are two stitch colors, black and blue. Um, so if I were to select my stitch length and I wanted one of the blue stitches like the zigzag or the double wide, I would just turn it to S1. Um, so every machine's different. If you have a different machine, I highly recommend you read the manual and watch maybe YouTube videos of people using it to get more comfortable with all the different settings. I've been sewing on this one for about, um, let me think, oh gosh, nine, I think it's nine years now. Um, so I'm pretty comfortable with my machine, but if you were to put another one in front of me, it would definitely take me a little bit to learn all the features. But going back up to this tension piece, so you can see here, there's a little diagram, let me get that clear, a little diagram of thread tension. So I'm gonna switch back over to my um, PowerPoint to kind of explain that a little bit more in depth, because it is one of the most important pieces of sewing on the machine. Because if you mess up the thread tension, chances are your everything you've sewn will probably come undone, or it'll just be really, um, messy looking. Okay. So we mentioned um, our thread tension piece is up here at the top. It might be different. Um, most of it'll be on the top or on the side of the machine. There we go. So when considering thread tension, you can see this photo on the right here is balance tension. So again, we're working with an upper um, thread and then our lower thread, so our spool and our bobbin. Um, the balance tension shows on this piece of fabric that each, um, both the lower and the upper thread are pulled at the same tension. So they meet really right in the middle. There is no excess thread on one side. And I'll go ahead and demonstrate for you also on my machine in a scrap of fabric what it looks like when the tension is um, very messed up. It's really something you need to check for every project um, because it can just, it really depending on the, um, the weight of your fabric and what thread you're using and the length of your stitches, um, it might be different. But the sweet spot is usually in between on my machine, three to five for tension. Um, it, there might be cases where you need to move it outside of that range, but it's something you can play around with. So in this example up on top, you can see the upper thread is too loose and that's because um, it's not really pulling your bobbin thread through. So it's just kind of holding it loose along the bottom edge of your fabric. And then same thing, if it's too tight, it'll kind of pucker. So I'm going to real quick show you um, what happens when your tension is really loose and too tight. Okay. So you can see already that, as I mentioned, it doesn't even pull 
that bobbin thread through. It is just a line sitting on top of your fabric and you can kind of see, I know it's a little bit hard, let me, um, but the, the loops, the stitches um, from the upper fab or from the upper thread are really loose. Like I can see them. Some of them are about an eighth of an inch coming up from the thread. And it looks fine from the other side. That looks like a proper stitch. That's why it's really important that you check both sides. Um, so that was a very, very loose upper thread. Now we'll do the opposite with a really uh, tight one. And this one is not as noticeable. Um, it doesn't have the really severe looping and loose thread, but you can see just the way that that fabric puckers, that shows you it's too tight. And these stitches, um, so this is like the underside of the fabric. So these will be the stitches made with the bobbin thread. Um, they're slanting. So each of them is getting pulled so tight that it kind of curves. And if you were to do this on a seam on a pant leg, you would end up with um, a lot of puckering. Um, so like I said, everyone is a little bit different, every fabric. My thread tension is usually at four or five. Um, sometimes it never really looks perfect, but as long as it's not puckering severely, I'm okay with that. Uh, Sydney, can you close out of the PowerPoint? Folks can't see your, your, uh, <laughs> folks can't see your swatch there. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Then we will, oh gosh. So then this right here is the one with the, um, with the tension too loose. And you can see uh, that a lot of the pieces come up and that our bobbin thread is very loosely held against. If I were to pull the bobbin thread, it actually just comes right out because there's not enough tension holding it in place. And then you can see for the other one, um, the puckering. So this is our too loose that I was able to just pull the string right out. And then this is too tight where it's going to pucker and strain your fabric and the thread in a way that you do not want. Um, and I'll show you one with just a medium tension. It won't be as noticeable, um, especially virtually, but. And Gina asked, what tension did you have it on for the loose and the tight? For the loose and the tight, I went the extreme route. Um, I had the loose setting at a zero and the tight at a nine. Um, but it's possible that you'll get similar results if you had it, let's say on a two for loose or even a six or a seven for tightness. Um, on my machine, and with I'm just using uh, cotton fabric right now, it's not as noticeable when the tension is too tight. It's incredibly noticeable when it's too loose, um, but it's also, okay, there we go. Um, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Um, so we have, that's one with tension at about, a four and a half. You can see the fabric's not puckering. When you flip it over to the other side, the stitches should all look about the same. Um, they should be noticeable, but not like either of the other where one was pulled too, uh, too much. And it's something that you can play around with. You can also watch like there, for every specific machine, there are lots of tutorials and videos for that specific machine. Um, so you might end up with a model that just tends to run a little bit tighter on the tension. So maybe you need to adjust it to be extra loose. Um, it is very machine dependent, but one thing that doesn't change is the fact that if it's too loose, you'll notice um, the bobbin thread is not held. And again, this is the one that I just pulled it out. Um, and if it's too tight, you will notice your fabric puckering. The good news is if you realize that you can always um, rip it out and just start over. I've had to do that many times. But one way to hopefully avoid that is cutting yourself a small sample of whatever fabric you're going to use for your project 
to test out the stitches you know you'll be using. Um, which brings us to our next piece, um, which is the different uh, types of stitches. There we go. So these are just some sample ones. These are the ones that are on my machine. Um, when we look at some of the different brands and models that are available, you'll see some have like upwards of 100 stitches to choose from. Again, I don't need that because I really just sew for personal use and mostly garments. So what I really use are A, which is our basic stitch that we just used. And that's what you'll use for almost all of your seams. Um, I frequently use G, which is used um, to finish a seam. So if you would sew that, usually you'll have a, um, a seam allowance standard, at least in the U.S., it's five eighths of an inch. And that gives you enough wiggle room to where if you need to take out a seam or let um, or take it in or let it out, it gives you some wiggle room. But then there's also room to finish your seam however you see fit. Um, professionally made clothing is usually surged, which is a another machine that uses four pieces of thread at once to like cut and finish an edge. They're really nice, but they're pretty expensive. Um, the most, the cheapest ones started about four to five hundred dollars. So if you plan on going into a clothing making business, or you just are really passionate about handmade clothing, it's it's a good investment. Um, it's not something I have personally invested in yet, because I found that G works just as well for me. Um, and some of these are decorative, like J. J is definitely decorative. Um, you would maybe use that if you wanted to do a nice just little finish along a hem or neckline. And then some of these are actually used for um, invisible hems, similar to if anybody has been to one of our previous programs where we do hand sewing skills, it's similar to our slip stitch hem. Um, so it's, and it's been a very long time since I've used one of these stitches, but the longer part, so if you're looking at E or F, um, it would catch the hem of your pants and then the rest of it would be invisible. It's it's a tricky one, um, but that's what those are used for. And I'll show you guys um, G, which is my preferred edge finishing one. So you would wanna use this anytime you are sewing something where the inside um, will be exposed. So if you were sewing a bag and you were going to put in a lining and the um, wrong side of the fabric was going to be enclosed, not something you really need to worry about. But if you're sewing any garments, you definitely need to finish the inside. Um, and then we also have our buttonhole stitch. Buttonholes, um, so I, that's probably my least favorite feature about my machine. It's, um, it's very fussy. It does not always work. I have learned, so it's supposed to be kind of an automated system, but for my machine, it doesn't work very well automated. Um, other machines will probably have different features, but so most frequently I use um, those stitches that were on there, A, G, and then buttonhole. Um, so I'll show you guys. Um, oh, and, and if you have a moment, Gina also asked, she said her machine has an S1 and an SS2, if you could talk on those. Um, so and if then, yours, Gina, do you know, are you sewing on a Singer machine as well? Because I think, because mine is S1, so that's why I'm asking. Um, I would think that you're using a Singer as well because you can, okay, yes. Um, so S1 is, as I mentioned, we have this dial here with all of our different stitches. You can see that a lot of them are doubled up um, with the black and blue. And when we look at our stitch length selector, let's focus, there we go. Um, we have, ranging from zero and stitch length all the way up to four. Um, so we'll also talk about in a minute how stitch length impacts certain stitches. Um, 
And then we also have on this machine, there's a little section to choose buttonhole. But then if you turn it all the way over to S1, it will then select um, whatever stitch is blue. So I use this stitch to finish my seams um, and I need to switch it over to S1. So stitch width, when we move it, um, it actually moves, let me see if, I hope this will be visible. Um, so it actually moves my needle. I know it's a very small difference, but it's pretty significant when you're sewing. It moves about a quarter of an inch. Um, so when I have it on zero, you can see there's actually a little marker on my machine. Actually, you probably can't see that because it's so small. Um, but it indicates that the needle is at the center point. So that means if you're sewing, you can use your guidelines here to gauge how long or how big of a, a seam width or seam allowance you want. Um, this one right here is five eighths, four, three, and so on. And if we widen our stitch, it gives us the full, depending on how wide we want it to go, it'll give us the full um, width of our presser foot. So it'll go back and forth. And this is really important with stitches like this one here. Any of them that go laterally, um, we need to adjust the stitch width. It does not matter for anyone that just goes in a straight line. Um, and I will now demonstrate this stitch so you all can see what I'm talking about when I mentioned that um, width impacts it. And you can also see one of the S1 stitches. So the nice thing about the S1 stitches is you don't have to worry about the length. It's just programmed to do a certain length. The only thing you need to adjust is the width. <clears throat> and we did have another question come up in chat whenever you have a moment. Um, mm -hmm. Once a new user asked, why is G better than B? Let me go to my better than B. Um, I like here, I'll share my screen again so you all can see um, those two stitches. So G gives you not only the zigzag, but also the, I guess I'll call it lateral stitch or no, not lateral, straight up and down. Um, so you get a stitch that is fortifying not only, so with woven fabrics, especially we have our warp and our weft. Um, those are the technical terms for the, the ones that go up and the ones that go across. Um, so if we're just pulling across, we're not really catching the, the fabric edge, which is where it's more likely to fray. So B might be, if that's your only option on your sewing machine, it is definitely adequate. It will hold up, especially if it's not something you plan on using every day. Um, but G gives you a little bit of extra reinforcements because it's across and then up and down as well just to kind of keep those edges from fraying. Um, so that is my two cents on why I prefer G. There are lots of different ways to finish seams. Um, you can use pinking shears, which are just a zigzag edge. And for whatever reason, through some magic, they don't fray the edge once it's cut. You can do flat felled seams. You can do a French seam. These are all things that if we are able to get more into garment sewing, I'd be definitely happy to discuss. Um, but for just kind of starting out basic projects, B or G, honestly, E and F could work. Um, but to me, G is the best because it goes diagonal and then up and down as well. And I will go ahead right now and just do a quick. Um, so one thing to consider, as I mentioned, thread tension is probably one of the most important pieces to sewing on a machine. And with every change in your stitches, there is a possibility that the tension needs to be changed as well. So with a stitch like G that goes back and forth and up and down, um, it's gonna be a little bit different than our basic stitch that just goes one after the other in a straight line. So I will show you, currently my tension is set to four. 
Um, I'm sewing through two layers of fabric and I have it set to G. So we'll see, I it might need to be adjusted. this so you can see this is the g stitch um it leaves a little bit of spacing in between that also has to do with how quickly i was able to thread it through the presser foot um so if you were working with a heavier weight fabric or even just running your fabric through the machine a little bit slower, chances are they might be a little bit closer together. So this is our top side, um, considered the right side of the fabric, even though this would most likely be on the inside of your clothing or sewing item. And then when we flip it over, we see that the tension looks a little messy. So this tension worked great for me when I was doing a basic um, basic stitch, but now you can see it's kind of puckering. Um, and to me, it looks like the tension is too tight. So I'm gonna slide it down to about a two and a half on my um, tension lever and go ahead and try it out. So this is why, like I said, it's really important that you have little scrap fabrics around. Um, I do this with every project. And then hopefully this one will come out a little bit better on tension. Yeah, this is a pretty significant difference. Um, and it would be different if I was only sewing through one layer of fabric. Um, like if I if I were sewing and pressed my seams open like that and needed to finish each side of my seam, um, chances are my tension would need to be even looser because there's less. I have found at least with a lighter weight fabric the tension needs to be a little bit looser because it's just more delicate. Um, so you can see there's a pretty significant difference just in turning my tension down about one and a half levels. Um, there's not that big gapping anymore. And then when we turn it over, it is still a little funky looking, um, but the stitch looks like it was intended to look. So it looks pretty similar to, um, these the little image on our sewing machine um and again this is just demonstrating why uh tension as well as here i'll do one that's really narrow for you all to see why width impacts stitches as well because maybe you're using this stitch decoratively or you have a really narrow seam allowance um so that might be a time when you want to actually set it to two and you don't want because when i when i set it to five on my machine the width ends up being about a quarter of an inch. Um, so just something to keep in mind on your machines, play around, see how wide um, and how much your needle can actually move back and forth. You can do the same thing for stitch length. So I usually sew for my basic stitch that I use for all my seams. I typically sew um, at about two and a half. Um, and I really only use that setting and then the four setting which is the longest stitch length um, i'll show you that one in a second and explain why i like to use that so right now i'm just going to do stitch on my machine it's stitch g um, really just a seam allowance finishing stitch on a little bit of a smaller width I've actually never done this stitch. It's such a tiny, um, it's really cute actually. Uh, so it's very small. Again, this was set to two as my stitch width. Um, 
we've got maybe an eighth of an inch there of width. Um, this one, like I said, that could actually be a really nice decorative piece like on a hem or a neckline. Um, or if you are into quilting, that could be, I'm not a quilter, someday I will be, um, but I could see this being used as a decorative quilting stitch for sure. Um, so now I'll show you the basic stitch set to length four um, and explain what I would use this for. Okay. So now the stitches are really, they're about maybe, I think they're about a quarter of an inch in between each stitch. Um, and it also, my tension was still a little low on that one, but it's okay. So I would use this stitch as a basting stitch or for gathering fabric. So basting would just mean it's a temporary seam. You're either going to pull it out or sew in a way that hides it. Um, it can be used if you're really maybe trying to see what a piece would look like and you're not sure that, um, like if you were making a bag and you're like, oh, I think I want my straps to be an inch and a half wide and you did the base stitch just to make sure because it is a lot easier to rip out because the stitches are longer. Um, you could really get in there with the seam ripper and just do a couple of stitches and then you can also gather it so the way you would do that is you would pull your bobbin thread just your bobbin thread not your top thread and it's a little hard because i've sewn all over this piece of fabric but you can see it's starting to gather so if you were sewing anything where you wanted ruffles and gathering this is how you would do it on a machine stitch. Um, so it's really just our way of using a machine to do a basting stitch instead of having to do it by hand. Okay, so those are the stitches that you'll really use most frequently if you're just doing kind of like basic projects or even garment sewing um, or quilting, because if you're quilting, you will be using um, the basic stitch to hold your pieces together. Um, and I do want to show you all some of my different presser feet and show you the buttonhole setting. Again, I don't love the buttonhole setting on my machine and every machine will be different. But just to give you an idea of some of the capabilities of sewing machine, I think it's important that we go over that. So my machine came with, I think, three different presser feet. You can get them at any any craft store, any store that sells sewing machine equipment. Um, if you break one, if you lose it, you need to replace it. Or there are some that serve really like special functions. I just use basic ones. Um, so this right here, is a zipper foot. Um, as I mentioned, I mostly do garment sewing. Um, so if anybody has any questions about garment sewing, I will be most likely helpful if there are questions about quilting. Um, that's not my area of expertise, but I definitely could try to help because um, you will not be using a zipper foot if you are quilting. But if you ever need to install a zipper or even repair one, um, so this would go, this is a great time to show you all up and up close, um, kind of what the presser foot looks like. So on my machine, I have a little lever at the back that I push up and down. Um, so this is what allows me to place my fabric underneath the foot and then pull that fabric in place. And you can hopefully y'all can see there is there's like little teeth that are underneath the presser foot and this is what helps hold the fabric and push it through so this gives enough pressure that it holds the fabric in place while still running it um so you don't want it to catch and on most machines there is a little lever or release 
So mine is right there. And when I pull it up, my presser foot just drops. So they all have um, a little bar that goes, okay, I have to set that down for just a minute. Um, Cause I'll need to hold this up and then slide my presser foot in. And then once I release that lever, it'll lock it in place. So really simple, again, you just pull that to release. And then when it's in its neutral position, it will hold your presser foot. Uh, so this one is used for zippers. It's because you can see there's two different sides. Um, so you would possibly need to switch sides um, depending on where your zipper is sewn. So you would really just sew along the edge of the zipper um, and that's what this foot is used for. So if you're not planning on sewing garments or bags or anything with the zipper, you probably won't ever use that piece. Um, this one, this is the buttonhole foot. Um, it's very large. They will all look different from machine to machine. The machines I learned to sew on, um, as I mentioned, they were uh, Husqvarna Vikings and uh, everything was pretty much digitized. So the machine, this, uh, the buttonhole feature in that machine was wonderful. Like you could just put in the size of your button and it would just do it for you very magically. Um, this one's a little bit more dependent on the user. So there is a little space here where you would actually put a button and this determines, there we go. Um, that would determine how long you would want to use the um, buttonhole stitch or how long to make it. So let's pretend I have a button in there that's about half an inch. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hook this up and show you all the buttonhole stitch, which is this one. So um, every machine's buttonhole features will be a little bit different, but it will be also very different from the other stitches that exist. So on this one, there is just one setting for the buttonhole. And then when we go up to our length, it's not, um, we set it to the buttonhole setting. So it's pretty much halfway in between one and zero. And this could be really useful if so sometimes buttonholes will start to fray on our clothing. So you could, um, if you wanted to repair, you could put um, a layer of fabric underneath whatever garment it is as kind of a reinforcement. And you could go and make essentially a new buttonhole using a little bit of fabric to help hold it in place. And then um, you would just cut a little hole in your fabric. I use a seam ripper which I think is at home right now. But if you are getting into sewing, highly, highly recommend using uh, purchasing a seam ripper. It will be one of your most used tools um, because we all make mistakes. So again, for mine, I just pull a little lever and um, put the presser foot in place. So the buttonhole, presser foot, they're usually pretty long and significantly larger than other presser feet. So they, you will probably only use them for one purpose. Um, and I'm going to go, I would like you all to be able to see what I'm sewing. Let's stay around with this. I don't have a YouTube or anything like that, so I'm not used to filming my sewing. But I'm thinking maybe I need to invest in one of those little clippable um, web cameras that I could just put it on my sweater and y'all could see up close. Okay. Just okay. So this is what it looks like. Um, you know, this is pretty much, the camera is pretty much eye level with um, my sewing area. You can see I have my thread or my fabric there. 
Um, we have our settings set to buttonhole. We have our buttonhole foot in, and we have the width or length adjusted as if there was a button in there. There we go. Okay. Um, and the width as well, you'll need to adjust. I usually do about two and a half for width. Let's see. As I mentioned, this is definitely my least favorite feature on my um, on my sewing machine. I don't know if it's just mine in particular that I've messed up or if it's this entire model, but it is a little bit difficult. You can see like it's not really wanting to thread the fabric through. So I'm gonna have to kind of hold on to um, the other edge and kind of pull it through. And you can see, I don't know if you can actually. So my thread has come on um, out from its um, one of the holding pieces. That'll happen quite frequently as you sew and it's not a big deal, you just put it back in. Yeah, and sometimes with mine, I have to like manually move the fabric. Um, I think it has something to do with the plastic foot. I'm not 100% sure though. It's not oh, <laughs> you can see here that it really did not want to move. Um, and it's kind of tangled up the bobbin thread a little bit, but that's okay because that pulled out. I'll try one more time. And again, I'm kind of holding both sides and pushing it through. You don't typically need to do this if you're doing another stitch. Um, and you might also find that your machine um, doesn't need to do this, but for whatever reason, mine does for the button stitch. So you would stitch as long as for the width of your button, and then you would actually um, for mine, I would switch it over to a regular stitch, reduce the length and increase the width. So I'm really just going back and forth. Um, see, it's not even, there we go. Um, back and forth. So you have to play around with it. Um, I'm not even going to finish the button, but you can see you can see that it does create a very fine, so this is like a really tiny zigzag stitch. Um, so that's why it's sturdy enough to hold a button because it finishes that raw edge. Um, and then you would be able to do it back down the other side. Like I said, mine, I end up having to use the, the reverse feature and then just kind of pushing it back the other way it came. A lot of machines nowadays, especially, are a lot um, smarter and very intuitive, and it's probably a much smoother process. Um, so that's just one thing to consider if you're looking to purchase the sewing machine, if you think you'll be using uh, the buttonhole feature a lot. Um, might be worth even trying some out to see how they work um, and what's going to be the best for you. So now we've talked about really those main stitches that you will probably use if you are looking to get into sewing on a machine. Um, does anyone have any questions about any of the stitches I didn't talk about? Any questions specific to your sewing machine? Anything? Um, uh, anything I can help with related to using a sewing machine. I do have a question. Yes. Yes. Go back to your little sample cloth again, please. The, yes. um, no. the, the other one, one. Yes. The one that is showing the scissors. See the very last two that you did. Yes. Like, yes. Now, when you did the like, second last, you show us you were at like a two. But then yes. when you did it 
the last one you did at four. No, no, the one on top. This one here. Yes. Wait, the very that top one. one. This one. So okay. the this uh, one question up. is the question is you use the same stitch style, you just increase the what to get because they don't even look like they have the same stitch. No, no, these two, um, the two below it are the ones that you use for finishing a seam. This one is our regular stitch that we were showing down here. Um, no, 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 the one on top. Yeah, no, the, yes, this, this, one, right this here? one. Yeah, wait. Yes. yes, this one is a standard. Um, that's just a regular stitch. Like, oh, it, yes. Um, it is not the same as the the three okay. next to it. Um, but it is the same as the ones we started out with. Um, and this is the one that I was saying. As you can see, you can pull and it will gather. Um, this one, I changed the stitch length to, uh, what, I had it at four. So that means because it's a stitch that just goes in a straight line, by changing the length, all I did was make that line a little bit longer. And it makes it a looser stitch. So I you see. can kind of see, I see. if I, I were see. to pull it apart, there's a little I bit see. more room than on this stitch, which I sewed at about a two and a half for length. Um, I see. Yeah. So it is a, it, the top one and the second top are not the same stitch style. They're not. No, these two. <laughs> yes, excuse me. <laughs> so, oh my God, what happened? <laughs> so you just, okay, the top one, you were just showing us that you, that the different st stitch length, that's what yes. you were showing. Okay. Yes. Um, and that one, like I said, can be used for basting, which just like a temporary stitch or for gathering. And then the, the ones below it. So this one, that's the, um, this same stitch, but set at a width of about two. Um, so you could use that for finishing a very tiny seam or just because it looks kind of nice. Um, but yes, this top stitch is the same style of stitch um, on my machine. It's just this here, just a basic straight line. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank yes, you. you are welcome. I'm glad. <laughs> glad I clarified. That would be very confusing. Okay. Um, I will go and again, pop in if anybody has any questions, feel free to interrupt. And I'll go back to my um powerpoint for another minute here okay, there we go um so next since we've gone over kind of the basics of the different parts of the machine how would how you would set it up to sew and then some of the um most essential and basic features and stitches that you will be using um excuse me Now, oh, excuse me, sorry, frog in my throat. <clears throat> um, so now we can talk about maintenance. So especially if you plan on using your sewing machine for a long time, it's really important that you keep up. Um, chances are that you might run into an issue that is beyond your skill level and you might need to take it to a repair shop. That's totally fine. I haven't needed to do that with my machine yet. Um, if you were using your machine daily or weekly, you might run into issues more quickly. But again, I've had my machine now for nine years. It truly is like the least expensive model. I think when I bought it, it was it was a gift, but I think it was about $129 at the time. I, I bought my mom the same model a few years later. It was around the same price. And I think typically full price, um, it's around $200 right now, um, but you know, you can wait till a sale or use coupons. Um, so some things to consider when caring for your machine. So our needles need to be changed. I am very embarrassed to say that I recently changed my needle and I could not remember the last time I had done it. Um, so they will get dull, especially if you use it frequently or if you use um, it on any heavier weight fabrics like denim or canvas or outdoor fabric. There are also lots of different kinds of needles. Um, if you were sewing with like jersey knit fabric or again, denim, 
you probably need to purchase a different needle than your sewing machine comes equipped with. Um, but there, so that's just dependent on your projects and you can research it. It also depends on your sewing machine brand. But you can see here I have, um, these are some extra needles that I have. These are just the basic, same ones that came with my machine. Um, and it's important to replace them because if your needle gets, um, if it gets dull, chances are it's going to um, cause snags in your fabric instead of cleanly creating stitches. It also increases the likelihood that your needle could break. Um, I think that happened to me in high school. I think I probably sewed over a, um, a pin. Um, I haven't, it's usually not an issue. So if you're, if you have two pieces of fabric together, you're usually going to want to hold them in place. I've seen a lot of people recently use like little clips along the edge. Um, I like to use just a regular pin to hold my fabric in place. But so change out your needles. If you use it really frequently, you might need to do this every couple of months. If your sewing machine is just something you pull out every now and then for projects, you probably don't need to do it unless you notice um, a decrease in your machine's performance. On my machine, I'll show you um, where I would change it. It's really not difficult. Um, I've changed needles on every machine that I've ever worked on. Which is not that oh. many, it's about three. Um, oh, but you can um, see. Sydney, oh, yeah, could you close you. out of your yeah, um, thank you <laughs> PowerPoint? Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now you can see. Um, so our needle goes up through there, and this knob here loosens it. Um, you know what? Why not? I'll go ahead. So I also have a few tools that came with my machine that are used for um, maintenance. And I keep them in my little, little toolbox. Um, so this one here, um, every machine will probably come with something a little bit different. Um, it's just like a little all purpose tool and it really helps. So you can also see here, there are some screws I haven't personally needed to um, take this off, but if you had like a really bad thread jam or if you were doing a really intensive cleaning, you could take this plate off and it would let you look down into the bobbin cavity. And then it also allows me to loosen my needle. Okay, let me think about this. Ready, steady, let's see. And it's a little, it feels a little nerve wracking because you're like, am I going to break something? But once you have it there, um, it'll actually down because my needle will drop and I don't want it to drop into the bobbin cavity. Um, so that is something to consider. So the needle actually just pulls right out. Um, really simple. Took me two seconds to do. I do recommend taking the presser foot off when you do that. Um, and then you would just place it back in and tighten up that screw. Definitely make sure it's tight because that would impact the performance of your machine if your needle is not properly inserted. Um, it's definitely going to affect the way your stitches come out. Okay. Um, so that's just one of, one of the things to consider with maintenance. I'll go back um, to talk about the other two. So cleaning, as I mentioned, um, and then light bulbs. So I've never had to replace my light bulb, but if that day comes, I will, um, you can just buy the replacement parts. You could also take it to a sewing machine repair shop. Um, there's definitely quite a few in Charlotte, uh, but I will talk about cleaning the bobbin cavity because this is very important. This actually gathers a lot of dust because little particles from our threads that come out of here kind of flake off. You can maybe see a little bit right here. It's a little dusty. I tend to clean my machine really frequently because that's just how I was taught to do it. Um, and you'll just need a tiny little brush. It could be like one of those bristle brushes that people use to clean their reusable straws. 
Um, I have a seam ripper that has some little bristles on the other end. Um, it's the one that came with my machine. And you would just kind of take them and put it up here along top of the um, bobbin compartment. And this is where if you knew it was really dirty, you could take this off and you would be able to kind of get behind the bobbin. Um, for folks with bobbins that are top loading, if that makes sense, um, chances are you will have to take something off to get kind of behind it. And then you'll also want to take your bobbin out and kind of get that little bristle brush in behind. Um, you'll pull out little, just little pieces of dust and thread, um, but that can impact your machine um, performance as well. Sydney, could you use compressed air? Oh, that's a great idea. Yes, um, especially if, especially if you were able to kind of get it behind those pieces and like push it out. So I have a large, <laughs> um, there's a pretty large like empty space right here. So if I were able to kind of get in there and push it out this way, um, I would not recommend trying to push it further in because um, that runs the risk of getting beyond the point where you can access it. But um, definitely compressed air. It's something you'll have to play around with depending on your machine make and model. And again, the internet is a wonderful place and chances are you can find somebody has created a sewing machine cleaning video for the exact machine that you have. Um, maybe with the exception of if it's a antique. Um, let's say I have sewn, actually that was the machine I technically learned how to sew on was an antique singer. Um, I had the big um, wheel on the side. So mine actually does have a wheel sort of. Um, so this allows me to adjust. Um, so this is really nice if I just need to do one stitch or if I'm coming to a corner and I need to turn at a specific point, you can really gently control your stitch, your stitches instead of using um, the foot, the electric foot. All right, and then um, I'll go back to my PowerPoint and we'll kind of discuss just some of the things to consider um, if you're looking to um, get a sewing machine for yourself, if you don't already have one, or if you're looking to um, replace it. So of course, cost um, is most likely going to be a factor if you are looking to purchase a sewing machine. They do make um, they're kind of like condensed size ones, maybe like you could call it travel sized or kid sized ones, um, that are, I've seen as cheap as like 99, maybe 130 full price. Um, and then of course they range up to several thousand. I would say if you were going to go to Joanne Fabrics and look at their sewing machine center, you can easily find a lot of sewing machines that range from about 200 to 700. Um, and it really just depends on what your needs are. So are you going to be using it just for personal use um, or are you looking to start a business? Um, what kind of projects will you be working on? If you are using it mostly for garments or maybe little handbags, Chances are you don't need anything that's incredibly heavy duty, but if you know you're going to be maybe making outdoor furniture and accessories um, or lots of like canvas duffel bags or something, you're probably going to want a heavier duty machine. Um, the machine that I have, it's Singer Tradition. Um, they make one very similar to this model. It's actually the one that was in the first. Um, it's actually this one. This is the Singer Heavy Duty. It goes up in price. Um, it's a little bit longer lasting, but pretty much identical to the one that I have. If you are a quilter or you would like to quilt or work on larger projects, you might want to consider a machine that has a larger, um, greater space in between the needle and the body. So if you were trying to quilt something, you are working with this much space to get your project. 
Um, there have been times where I'm hemming something and I need to fit my entire project through this hole and it's a, it's a little bit tricky. So if you know you wanna do larger scale projects, um, maybe invest in a long arm, just going to chain one that specific for quilting. And then um, maybe you want to get really into embroidery. Uh, one of my coworkers was gifted a very nice sewing machine for Christmas that has the capability of doing computerized like input. You input a design and then the sewing machine just magically embroiders it. Um, so there's some really cool features out there. And then of course you can get one with the computerized stitches. Those typically have more stitch options. Um, so it really just comes down to personal, personal use. And then we'll talk about some of the different brands. There's a lot of brands of sewing machines. These are the ones that I'm most, um, familiar with and that you will see in most stores. So the Singer, this is my make and model that I have the tradition. It's going to be one of the most affordable ones on the market. Um, this is a vintage singer. So if you've ever been at a thrift store or something, chances are you've seen one. Um, I actually sew on an old sewing table. So it used to house an, a sewing machine and it would have flipped under. And I just put um, a piece of fabric or not fabric, um, a little piece of wood over it. And so on that, they're really nice. You can get them at thrift stores for like $20. Um, Brother makes some great ones. You can see here is an example of a machine that has um, a lot of digitized stitch options. So this is where um, if you have a machine like this, instead of turning knobs for your width and your length and your stitch selection, you're just going to be able to input it um, using those little dials and buttons. But you can see with most, they have the same features. They have the bobbin winder, your spool, um, your spool holder. The threading process is pretty much the same where you go down and up, hook it, and then back down. Husqvarna Viking. Um, this is the brand that I learned to sew on in high school. V some very, very nice sewing machines. Um, this would be a dream product for me someday, but they tend to be um, definitely a lot pricier, but some of them have um, some really cool features and they like you can see this one on the left here. It actually hides your spool. Um, and it's very fancy. And then Janome as well. Again, this one on the left, um, there's a little bit of a larger cavity. So this and a little bit of a longer workspace. So that might be really helpful if you are looking to quilt. Um, so those are just some of the brands. You can really get a sewing machine almost anywhere. Walmart sells them. Um, Joanne, Fabrics, Michaels, there are several um, local sewing machine stores. There's one, I believe, over off of South Boulevard. I think there's one closer to like Mooresville, North Mecklenburg County area. Um, and then of course you could always find one online. I, if you choose to buy a refurbished or used sewing machine, I would just see if you can get some sort of certification that it's still functioning, um, especially if it's your first time buying a machine. Uh, so that is really all I had as far as sewing machine goes today. Um, does anyone have any questions, any thoughts? Um, if anybody has a sewing machine that they'd like me to look at or show me something that they have a question about, please feel free. And I'm going to go ahead and just put my bobbin back in place. Uh, I'm sorry, I've got another question. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't have any question on what you presented today, but I do have a machine that I was given as a gift, but it's not working quite right. And that's the tension. But I took it partially apart. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a piece missing in there Ooh. that or uh, 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 broken. But mm -hmm. I I took a video of it already. Oh. And I, I'm wondering if <laughs> I was going to hook it to Joanne, but if you if you I mean I don't need to show I can't show it to you now because it's already you know on my cell phone video. <laughs> can I send it to you and and then you see if you can tell me 
where to find this replacement part if you even know? I would say you can definitely send it to me. Um, I will say I have only used this sewing machine for the last nine years. So if it is yes. not my particular make and model, I will probably not be very helpful. Oh, I um, see. Okay. But please still send it to me on the off chance that I know the answer or the solution. Um, yes, that is that sounds great to me. Wait, my because I already determined, I already made uh, made that the discovery. It most likely is that piece, but the problem is because it's an older machine. Well, I mean, vin vintage. Yeah. So you know, it's, <laughs> so it's a, not like I can go to a store and buy the replacement part or something like that. Yeah, so, that one. You're probably going to have best luck at um, a local sewing machine repair store. I can you can send me the video and I can send you some of the ones that I know of. I haven't personally used them, um, but I've heard good things about them. I see. Because okay. since they deal with a lot more sewing machines and like the actual parts than I do. Um, they might be more helpful, but yes, I'm definitely happy to help as much as I can with that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. My son D said they'd love to learn garment. I love, love, love garment sewing. Um, so this is, you know, this is an evolving series. We do this once a month. It started out virtual with hand sewing. Um, but people have a large interest in using machines. Um, difficulty is I'm just one person. Um, so if people have machines that they're able to bring in, we could do some sewing, sewing on machines. And I could even design some programs that are more focused on what the process of sewing your own garments looks like. Um, That'll be kind of a long-term project and we'll see how it evolves. If it's something you're like, I'm ready. This is a project I want to focus on right now. I can say CPCC has several sewing classes. Um, I think they have one that's like sewing for beginner. They do have some more advanced ones. Personally, someday I would like to take the one on pattern making and alterations um, so that I can make clothing that is even more personalized. Oh, awesome. Okay, Gina. All right. So we will, so Christy is our point of contact. Again, I don't work at the library anymore, but I'm definitely comfortable with you all having my email. And um, Christy is really awesome about communicating anything you send her. She is great about sending to me. Um, so yeah, if we can, again, it's an evolving process. We started out not knowing what people's interests would be. Um, Dee and Gina, yeah, we might have to see if we can get a bring your own sewing machine program, maybe um, March or April, because um, February we do already have planned, but and maybe even, yeah. So Christy and I will talk. If you are definitely interested in bringing a sewing machine, maybe send Christy an email afterwards, just sharing contact information, letting her know um, so that as she and I plan future programs, we can maybe even reach back out to you personally. Um, to see maybe days and times that work best for you. Um, so yeah, thank you. I'm glad everyone's excited about that. So we do still have 30 minutes left on our program. Um, for those of you who picked up the Take and Make kits, um, since this was our first program of this style, we weren't really sure what to expect, how much time we would have. The past programs I've done have just been... Um, hand sewing basics because it's more accessible and everybody can get a needle and thread, but not everybody has a sewing machine. So since we have a little bit of time, um, if you all would like, and please feel free to log off if this was enough for you, you're ready to go about your day. Um, but I am happy to go over some of the hand sewing basics. So all you'll need for this, and I'll move my sewing machine out of the way in just a second, but all you'll need for this are two pieces of fabric. Um, if you have the take and make kit, you have a little, tiny little sewing kit in it. It'll just look like this. It'll have five different colors of thread, two different buttons, and then there's a needle in there. Um, I do not um, definitely, don't recommend using that needle because the eye is incredibly tiny. 
and I struggled to thread it. So there will be a needle. It's actually an embroidery needle because it has a larger eye. Um, so there, if you have a take and make kit, that's what you have with you is just a needle, some thread and fabric. The only thing I did not provide is scissors. Um, so if you want to stay on and just learn some quick, basic, most likely to be used for some quick hand repairs of clothing um, skills, please, please do. I'm going to switch over and grab my hand sewing items right now. And again, if, if you think of any questions, just come off me or put it in the chat and I will answer. I'm going to put my sewing machine to the slide so it'll be a little noisy for me. Stella, I think I'm going to say, I think you're off mute right now. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then also, so sewing machine, I actually have a nice little transporter that my dad got me one year for Christmas. It looks like a little snow, uh, suitcase. That's how I brought it to the library this morning. Um, I also like my model because it has a handle, um, which makes it really easy. Thank you, LaFonda. Um, we do our next sewing program in February. It will be hand sewing. So if you want to come to that one um, and learn the hand sewing skills, you're more than welcome to. We also have... Um, oh, yeah, and, we'll, and you'll also be doing uh, sewing a, a mug cozy yeah. in February. Yeah. <laughs> so there will be a project for that one. Um, we've been doing that the last few months, having a little project for each um for each month last month we made little ornaments the month before that we made bookmarks um okay so i i think that your microphone's still on mm -hmm. able to okay. all right so if you have your um hand sewing materials if you don't you just want to watch along that's what i'm going to do right now um We'll go over four basic stitches that you would use most frequently if you're doing any hand sewing projects or if you're doing any um, repairs, especially on garments. Um, okay. And I might move a little bit more quickly just because usually this program would take up significantly more time and we only have about 25 minutes left. But if you have questions, please just pop in. All right, so the first thing that you'll need to do is thread your needle. As I mentioned, please use the one, if you took the take and make kit that was kind of pinned to your fabric, um, it's going to be much easier to work with than the one that comes in the sewing kit. So once you have it threaded, the first stitch we'll be doing is um, called the back stitch. And it's the, most similar to a stitch created on a sewing machine that you can achieve with the hand stitch. It can be very um, strong, especially if you're able to practice and get your stitches smaller and closer together. Um, so this would be a great way if you can't, um, if you don't have access to a sewing machine, but you still want to do some projects, this is going to be the best way to kind of recreate that sewing machine, machine stitch. So once you have your needle threaded, um, you'll want to tie your ends together. So when you're sewing by hand, you can choose to either pull one string longer and tie just one end, or you can tie them both together. I think tying them both together is typically easier. Um, and with the back stitch, it also kind of strengthens because you're using two strands of thread instead of just one to create your stitches. 
So I recommend tying two to three knots in the same place. As long as the knot is larger than the eye of the needle or the head of the needle, I guess, um, you don't have to worry about it pulling through. Okay, there we go. So again, this will be called the back stitch. Um, this one, the name is very literal. So we are going to start with our needle actually. Um, so for demonstration purposes, I'm gonna make my stitches a little bit larger. I'll make them about a quarter to a half an inch. Um, like I said, the more you practice, the smaller your stitches can get and the smaller they are, the stronger it is. But this is just practice, so it's okay if they're larger. Um, so you will start with your needle about a quarter of an inch to half an inch away from uh, the edge of your fabric. And you just pull that through. So you can see on that side, I have um, not, it's not pulling through the fabric, which means I tied it large enough. And then on this side, we have our needle and our working thread. So now we go over about, I'm doing a quarter of an inch. It's a little hard to see. Okay. About a quarter of an inch down from where um, I first came up. And here we go. Just like that. So now we have our first stitch. There we go, you can see that. Um, so now we will go, if we turn it over to the wrong side of the fabric where we have our knot, we're going to go over again about a quarter of an inch, trying to keep in line with that first stitch. So you'll go up and see this is the right side. Pull it through. And now our needle and our working thread, we're going to actually put it back down right near where that other stitch begins. You can even, if possible, get it through the same hole. Okay, so now we have two stitches. And then if we look at the back side, we're starting to see you get a little bit of overlap. Go up through and then so this is why it's called the back stitch because there we go because you're literally just going back um and i would say similar to sewing on a machine when you're sewing by hand tension is important um so definitely make sure as you sew that you're pulling the threads all the way through. Like you can see there, that one's kind of looping a bit. So I just need to make sure that they're both taut, but you don't want it so tight that your, um, that your fabric starts to pucker. You just want it to be laid flat with the stitches, um, even with the fabric. And this is the back side, So you can see that it kind of goes back over on each other. And this is part of what makes it such a strong stitch. Um, and it actually on the other side looks very similar to a machine stitch, especially if you can get your stitches um, to be shorter. So I'll do a couple more just to kind of show you what it might look like as a finished product. And then um, what it would look like if maybe you were using this to, let's say side, the side seam on your pair of pants is coming undone or you need to take in at the waist of a shirt. Um, so this would be really useful for doing that. It's a great way to tailor and repair clothing without a sewing machine. Okay. So that is our back side. You can see there, that's our knot. And then this is the front side. So it looks 
pretty similar to what we what I showed you earlier on my sewing machine. Um, again, these stitches are a little bit longer than I would do if I was using this for an actual project, but that's okay because we're practicing. Um, let me go a few more so I can show you why it's such a strong stitch. Um, and you'll be able to see for yourself, especially if you've gotten your stitches smaller than mine, because when you go to um, pull those pieces of fabric apart, as you would if you were opening up a seam or even just wanting to make sure that it was sturdy enough. Um, oh, I forgot I had my, um, but when you kind of pull it apart, it looks, you can see a little bit because I made my stitches longer, but it's not coming undone immediately. Um, it's strong enough that that'll hold, especially if it's a piece of clothing, like that, that seam is gonna hold. You don't need to worry about it coming undone. So the next thing we need to know how to do is to um, finish or bind off is a knitting term, but I use it in sewing too. So when I say bind off, I just mean we're going to tie a knot. The easiest way to do that is to make sure you have enough thread on your needle so that it's about two times the length of your needle. You're going to slip that needle underneath the thread, not through the fabric, just underneath that thread. And then you're going to hold it about halfway and wrap the thread around your needle. Like that. I recommend doing this twice. So again, you slide it under the thread, not through the fabric, just the thread. And then you need to wrap the thread around your needle and pull through. So it's a much easier way of tying a knot than like cutting it and trying to get it down as close to the fabric as possible. This is just quick and efficient. Next up, um, let me think, how are we on time? So normally I would do a button, but because a button, that seems to be the one thing most people actually do know how to do. I am going to move on to um, the slip stitch, which um, is frequently used for uh, hemming, usually a nicer piece of clothing like dress pants or um, a dress. And the slip stitch when done correctly means that your hem is pretty much invisible. So um, I recommend that you cut about 12 to 18 inches of thread for this one. And I also recommend that you only tie a knot on one piece of the string. So instead of tying them together and pulling it even, I recommend that you keep one longer than the other and not the longer one. Um, because it's a rather delicate stitch, this is a time when it's nice to only have one piece of thread that we're working with. So for your um, piece of fabric, if you're sewing along, I'd say fold it up about a quarter to half an inch. Um, and then since it's, uh, if you have the take and make kit, it's just cotton. Um, it usually holds pretty well if you just kind of crease it. Um, and then you want to fold it again up the same width. Uh, you should also have that extra little needle in your kit. Um, so you can use that extra needle, excuse me, just a second. Okay, 
So I'm trying to get my needle out of my little sewing kit. Um, you can use that sewing needle to kind of hold your fabric in place. Or of course, if you have any pins, um, definitely recommend using a pin. I'm just going to hold it in place. Um, just one across. Okay. Um, it'll make it a lot easier to do our stitches. So again, we have um, a knot tied on just one end of our of our working thread. Um, you'll probably have to tie three just because it's a little bit less thread and it's going to be a little bit smaller. Okay. And now we have kind of like a burrito. It's a little bit harder to see with the blue fabric, um, but so you'll have a roll inside of your, um, your hem. So we'll be starting on one of the edges um, and our first stitch will actually be, if I can get a better angle on this. Our first stitch will actually be going up in between the folds and going up at the top of that fabric. So it's kind of like going up into the mountain, the mountain peak, um, and just going through the side. You're going through one layer of fabric here, and you're going to pull through. Oops, accidentally unthreaded my needle. You're going to pull through. And um, your knot will be now hidden on the inside of um, inside of that seam. So this is, like I said, great if you're doing a hem. Um, so now we'll go over about a quarter of an inch to just the first layer of fabric. So you're going above the mountain peak. You're grabbing about two to three. Um, little threads from the fabric. So we want it to be really delicate. Um, this is what will allow this stitch to be essentially invisible from the outside. So I picked up, you can see my needle is attached to the thread or attached to the fabric, but just by a little bit. And it's just through that one layer. Okay, there we go. Um, and it's slightly above the fold. So all of our stitches will be really within about a quarter to an eighth of an inch uh, width wise. It's not a stitch where we're going a lot up and down. Um, so once we have that stitch there, you'll go ahead and go through just the folded fabric. So we're going through two layers of fabric right at the top of the fold. So we're really just catching the fabric that's kind of along this, the hemline. And when we pull through, we can see there's, it'll start to create a little bit of a zigzag shape. So again, we go up above the fold through one layer. And then down. Up. And I'll show you all, um, let's say I have a few more stitches, I'll show you kind of what it should look like. And then again, up through the top. As always, the more you practice these things, the easier it gets. Um, and the smaller, or I guess I should say, the closer together your stitches are, the stronger it is going to be. Um, so this is my right side. Let me pull that out. You can see because I'm using pink thread on blue fabric, you can see those little pinpoints. Um, that's my thread. That is the only thing that's visible of the seam on the outside. And if I were using matching thread to my fabric, it would be invisible. On the inside, you can see it kind of forms a little bit of a zigzag. This is why it's called the slip stitch, because it really just kind of slips in. Um, it's very delicate um, and is most often used for hands.
And same thing for this one. If we are going to bind off, we will um, just grab a little bit of that fabric at the top near where we finished our last stitch, pull it through, and then slide the needle in. Again, we're going to pull. pull through, thread over, and pull the needle all the way up. Okay. We have only a few more minutes. Um, I will show you the satin stitch, which is actually an embroidery stitch, and it can look really beautiful and um, uh, decorative, but it can also be used to seal um, a hole. It'll look actually really similar to the buttonhole stitch that we used or that I showed you earlier on my machine. Um, just a little bit, not quite as neat because we're humans. Um, so it'll just be lots of little stitches back and forth. Um, so if we had a rip under here, and especially if this stitch was a little bit wider, it would repair that hole. Um, so this can be used to cover up a hole if you want to kind of strengthen, especially if it's like on the knee of your jeans and it's a place that gets a lot of wear and tear, I do recommend um, maybe putting a piece of fabric underneath it to kind of um, strengthen it. Um, so the satin stitch, if you are sewing along um, and you have a pair of scissors nearby, you can cut just a little, a little tiny hole, um, maybe a quarter of an inch to a half an inch doesn't have to be anything special, just a little bit of a hole um, so that we can practice sewing over um, the hole. The satin stitch is also a great one to use with embroidery floss. Because embroidery floss is, um, I believe it's six, six pieces of thread twisted together. So it's a lot thicker um, and you can get a matching or decorative color and um, kind of breathe new life into your clothing. Um, this is also a good one to do with um, both ends knotted together just to give you a little bit more thread to work with because our whole purpose is using the thread to cover up a hole. Um, so the more thread it's going to be a little bit easier to do that quickly and efficiently. The hardest part with this stitch is tension. Um, so I always say if you were doing this at home and it was especially a larger thing you wanted to repair, I recommend getting a um, embroidery hoop. So it hold your fabric taut like that and you could just go in and do your thing. Um, it is a little bit trickier to do just holding it. But so I do have my little tiny little hole right there. So I'm going to start my stitch about an eighth of an inch to the side of um, to the side of the hole and then go across about an eighth of an inch over. So the satin stitch when it's done will actually kind of look satiny. Um, this one is really simple. You were just going back and forth right next to each other. So you want to make sure your stitches are as close to each other as possible. Um, and you also kind of want to check the tension, the way you're holding your fabric, because if it's too tight, um, it'll kind of pucker. And if it's too loose, it'll do the same thing. So that's why if you were doing this for a project, um, I recommend getting yourself an embroidery hoop. But the idea is really just kind of stitching these two exposed raw edges together. And to help prevent them from fraying or creating a bigger hole. And I know we are coming up on time. So again, if anybody has any questions, please feel free. Um, this is um, a monthly program. Our next one is February 16th. I want to say 16th. Um, that second Saturday in February. Um, and we'll be doing little mug cozies as well as 
Um, if you have any projects that you're working on, um, especially mending projects, please feel free to bring them. I always bring my sewing supplies. So we'll have like scissors, fabric scissors, um, lots of different colors of thread, and then a lot of scrap fabric. Um, and then for those of you who are even more interested in learning like garment sewing, especially on a machine, um, please reach out to Christy. Uh, this is just something I enjoy doing uh, and it's really for you all. So if you want to learn something and we can figure out how to make it happen, I would really enjoy that. So this is not the best example, but this is a satin stitch. You know, you can make them closer together. You would cover the whole hole and it, it, it serves its purpose. That hole is covered up. I did this on my boyfriend's jeans. They were ripping at the pocket. Um, this was three and a half years ago and he still wears the jeans. So it works, especially if you use um, embroidery floss on a thicker fabric. And then we didn't go over sewing a button today, but again, that's a skill I found a lot of people already have, um, or you can come to our next program and learn that one. So thank you all for being with us today. Really enjoyed myself. Um, if you have any more questions, reach out to Christy and um, I'm happy to answer. February 11th. Yes, the, yes, the next one's February 11th. I gave everyone the link uh, so that you could sign up. I think we have a few spots still left available. This one, the next one's gonna be in person um you know feel free to register um also this you know since this program is recorded if you missed something that sydney said today um you will be able to go back and see it um we'll post it on the the, the library's um um uh, website and so whenever that comes available we can let you guys know um but again we really appreciate you coming out today um do you have any other questions for Sydney before you go? Okay. I would, well, I was I'm sorry, go say, ahead. <laughs> um, so with our in-person programs, you know, it is still limited to 10, but you know, maybe you get on that wait list. You could always call the morning of, um, truthfully for the in-person programs, a lot of times people forget or can't make it. Um, so more likely than not, there will be space for you if you would like to attend, um, even if you didn't get to that initial 10 person uh, list. And it's it's here at Independence Regional. Um, thank you all for the feedback. Um, Y'all have been wonderful. And thanks for coming out today. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. But again, thank you, everyone, for coming out. All right. Have a good one. Bye bye.